This video covers sections 1.3 and chapter 10. In your textbook, those are pages 329 to 341. While you watch this video, you should take notes. You can pause and rewind it as necessary to make sure you get all the information in contained in the slides. However, I would strongly suggest that you go back and read those pages in your textbook to make sure that you get even a better understanding of the material pre presented in this video. As you're taking notes, you might want to use some shorthand to, uh, or use your own words so that you're not writing so much. So let's get started. Um, we are going to be focusing primarily on liquids and solids in this chapter, but to understand liquids and solids, we're going to start by talking about gas behavior. We're going to study something called the kinetic molecular theory, which really just refers to the motion of molecules. So that'll help us understand the behavior of gases, and it gives us a model for things that we're going to call ideal gases. Uh, an ideal gas is just a hypothetical, hypothetical gas that fits these um, assumptions of our kinetic molecular theory perfectly all the time. So what is the kinetic molecular theory based on? Well, it's based on these five assumptions. Number one is that the gases, any gas, consists of lots and lots of tiny particles that are really, really far apart. Number two. Those particles are going to be able to collide with each other and with the wall of their container. Those collisions we're going to call elastic collisions. Elastic just means that no energy is lost when they bump into each other. Those gas particles are going to be moving in straight lines rapidly and therefore because they're moving we would say that they have kinetic energy which is the energy of motion. The particles are not attracted to each other and what we're saying about their kinetic energy is that the faster that they move, they're higher their temperature. So that temperature and kinetic energy are directly related. Molecules that are moving fast and faster and faster have a high temperature. Molecules that are moving slower have a lower temperature. And if molecules stop moving at all, then we say that they are absolute, at absolute zero. Now, some physical properties of gases. Some of these you may have heard of before, some of these you may not have. The first one is that gases can expand. They fill their container and therefore they take the shape and the volume of their container. Gases are also considered fluids. Now this is sometimes confusing to students because we're so used to fluids being liquids. But in science, a fluid is just anything that can flow. So liquids and gases which can move are considered fluids. Gases usually have very low density which means that because their particles are far apart, they have a very small mass in what could be a very, very large volume or a low density. They can be compressed, which means that when they have pressure put on them in a container, the particles can be forced to move closer together and they can take up a smaller amount of space than they did previously. They can diffuse, which means that when you mix two gases together, the particles will randomly move around until they're dispersed more evenly. They mix. And lastly, they can effuse or effusion, which is the process by which a gas particle passes through a little tiny opening. Some gases will deviate from ideal gas behavior, and we call those gases real gases. A real gas is a gas that does not behave completely according to the assumptions of the kinetic molecular theory. You could kind of make an, um, an, an analogy to we have ideal students, students that do all their work perfectly all the time, or real students, kids who do most of their work most of the time. A, a real gas will behave like an ideal gas most of the time, but specifically at very high temperatures and low pressures. Noble gases, like helium and neon, act like ideal gases at a wider variety of temperatures and pressures. Now, what we will do is we'll start focusing on liquids. That's what this chapter, Liquids and Solids, is all about. So, liquid, we know, is a form of matter that has a definite volume. That means it's defined. And it, has, it does take the shape of a container. So if you have 40 milliliters of water and spill it, the 40 milliliters will stay the same, but it will take on a new shape. The particles in a liquid are in constant motion just like a gas. However, they are closer together and they are more attracted to each other. 
we call these forces that they attract intermolecular forces, which we'll learn about a little bit later. Liquids are also considered a fluid because it can flow, and anything that is a fluid will take the shape of the container. Remember, gases were also considered fluids. Now, some properties of liquids that you may have heard of before. They have relatively high density. Compared to gases, the particles in liquids are a lot closer together, so therefore they have more mass in the same amount of space as a gas. They have relative, relatively low incompressibility. You can't squish the particles of a liquid together, closer together, so they do not compress very much at all. They do have the ability to diffuse, but it's slower in liquids because the liquid particles are moving slower um, than gas particles, and so therefore they have a little less kinetic energy. They have what we call surface tension. Surface tension is the force that tends to pull the liquid molecules together right at the surface of the liquid, and it decreases the surface area to the smallest possible size. This is why water beads up on your skin, or drops of water can stick to a penny. It's due to surface tension. Liquids also have what we call capillary action the attraction of a surface to the of a liquid to the surface of a so solid this is why when you are at a restaurant and you put your finger over the top of a straw you can get some of the liquid to stay in the straw they have the ability to vaporize which just means that it's changing to gas you'd usually have to add energy to get something to vaporize they can evaporate which means that they can turn from a liquid to a gas um, but it's not at a boiling point this can happen over time just sitting out in the air. They have the ability to boil, which means that they're changing from a liquid to a gas, and they will be doing that at a specific temperature and pressure. And they have the ability to freeze, which means they're changing from a liquid to solid. Most of these are familiar to you already, but some of them might have been new. Now, to move on to solids. Solids, um, particles have are the closest together. They're very tightly arranged and and organized. Um, they just kind of have a tendency to vibrate back and forth. They can't really move past one another. And some properties of solids are that they have a definite shape and volume. So they hold their own shape and they have a consistent volume. They have defined melting points and that would be the temperature at which the solid will change into the liquid. They have high density and high incompressibility Okay, they're definitely more dense. They have a lot of mass and a small amount of space. You can't put those particles any closer together, so they're incompressible. They have a low rate of diffusion. Um, they're not going to mix together very easily. Now, there are types of solids, and there's two types of solids. The first is a crystalline solid. Um, a crystalline solid means that the particles are arranged in a crystal lattice, and this picture right here is an example of sodium chloride or regular table salt that you would see in a crystal lattice. The Na's are the purple in this diagram, the Cl's are yellow, and so you can see that their particles are arranged nice and organized in a crystal lattice. Okay, so most of your ionic compounds, metals with nonmetals, are going to be arranged in ionic crystals. There's a second class of crystalline solids called covalent network crystals. Covalent network crystals are pretty rare. They have extremely high melting points, and those are things like quartz and diamond, silicon carbide, and your book gives you a few more examples of these things. The third kind of crystal is a metallic crystal, which for most of us we would just refer to as being a metal. Some examples of those are mercury and copper, iron, aluminum, etc. And the last time of type of crystalline solid is something called a covalent molecular crystal. Now a co covalent molecular crystal is something that we would have called a covalent or molecular compound when we were learning how to name these. Things that involve two or more nonmetals like CH4 or NH3 or H2O, etc. Those are all considered molecular crystals. And we can divide, we can decide if a molecular crystal is polar or nonpolar. Remember with ionic compounds, ionic compounds are always just ionic. The last type of a solid is something that is called an amorphous solid. Amorphous means that it's randomly arranged. The particles are randi randomly arranged. These are a little bit more rare. They don't have defined melting points. 
Um, and some examples of these would be any container made out of plastic or a glass. Those generally have an amorphous solid. They are very random arrangements of particles. And that pretty much brings us to the end of our introduction on liquids and solids. Like I said, you can read the pages in the textbook for more information. It's chapter 10, sections 1 through 3, or pages 329 to 341.